It's 6 p.m. on a Tuesday here in Korea. Welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Tre. Let us begin with the headlines. President Macron announces changes to her cabinet, including the culture and environment ministers, to further her push for a creative economy and cultural prosperity. New data from NASA suggests last month was our planet's hottest month on record due to the El Nino effect. Scientists warned that until mankind gets a hold on carbon emissions, the mercury will continue to rise. And at the Olympic Games, the South Korean men go down in the quarterfinals of the badminton doubles, but there's still a chance for gold in the women's event. North Korea, meanwhile, clinches a gymnastics gold in the men's vault. President Macron announces a small-scale reshuffle today, naming new chiefs of three ministries. A shakeup is expected to further better implement rather her policy initiatives in the remaining 18 months of her term. Song ji san starts us off with an intro of the Fresh Faces. President Buck is gearing up for another push to implement her policy initiatives. A day after her Liberation Day speech, the president announced a partial cabinet reshuffle aimed at advancing her creative economy and cultural prosperity drives. Cho yun Sun, President Buck's former secretary for political affairs and a former gender equality minister, has been appointed to lead the culture ministry. I feel a tremendous sense of responsibility and duty to be appointed as the new culture minister when Korea is establishing itself as a global culture powerhouse. Through the flourishing of our culture, I'll do my best to help build a strong, beautiful and culturally rich country where people can live happily and leisurely. The presidential office of Chung Wada says it has great expectations for her as Cho has a deep understanding of President Buck's policy initiatives after having served as one of the president's closest aides for years. With her ample experience working for the government and at the National Assembly, we expect Cho will contribute to the advancement of cultural prosperity in the arts, content development, tourism and sports. Kim Jae-soo, the current chief of the state-run Korea Agri-Fisheries and Food Trade Corporation, has been appointed the new agriculture minister. Cho kyung gyu deputy director of the Office for Government Policy Coordination, will now lead the Environment Ministry. The two positions were widely expected to have fresh appointments as the ministers had been in their positions since President Buck's inauguration, leaving Foreign Minister Yoon byung se as the only cabinet member to have maintained his post. The president also named new personnel at vice ministerial level. President Buck's current trade secretary, Chong man gi is the new first vice minister for trade, and agriculture secretary, Chong hwang gun will now serve as chief of the Rural Development Administration. President Buck is hoping that the new cabinet members will give her a boost in accomplishing her policy goals for the remainder of her term. The appointees will go through a round of parliamentary hearings and take office early next month, in time for the start of the next regular National Assembly session. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. Meanwhile, lawmakers kicked off a two-week-long extraordinary session. The rival parties and the public are hoping for some tangible results by the end of the month, but many expect a bumpy road ahead as a number of contentious issues have to be resolved. Jim young gil has the latest updates from the National Assembly. After a prolonged period of gridlock and inaction, Korea's major political parties have pledged to work together and pass bills aimed at improving people's day-to-day -day lives during a two-week extraordinary session at the National Assembly. The Special Parliamentary Committee on Budget and Accounts has already begun its review of the government's multi-billion dollar supplementary budget plan. The rival parties agreed last week to vote on the budget bill on August 22nd. The extra funds will be used to invigorate Korea's sluggish economy in the latter part of the year. Apart from the budget supplement, the parties are expected to lock horns over parliamentary hearings on the managerial failures of Korea's ailing shipbuilders. The floor leaders of the three parties have agreed to deal with the extra budget first and then proceed with the hearings. We urge the opposition support. The ruling party should not make the mistake of thinking that the hearings will be conducted in haste. If the hearings get postponed over the scope of the witness list, then the vote on the extra budget bill on the 22nd will have to be cancelled. 
We should call in as witnesses government officials who can take responsibility. We do not intend to make the hearings an occasion for fierce political battles, but through the hearings we hope to avoid wasting taxpayers' money. The rival parties plan to look into the root causes of the industry's financial woes and discuss the presidential office's involvement in a state-run bank's decision to inject billions of dollars into struggling tail shipbuilding and marine engineering. Kim young Adirang News. South Korea's decision to deploy the THAAD anti-missile defense aims to deter North Korea's nuclear threats, but Pyongyang does not seem to back down, with the North saying that it is unwilling to give up its nuclear weapon program. A breakthrough in inter-Korean exchange isn't likely to happen anytime soon. Connie Kim reports. North Korea has reiterated that it'll not give up its nuclear weapons program and that it's not a political bargaining chip, as it's the regime's own protection from U.S. threats. The North state-run website Uri Minjokiri said Tuesday that possessing nuclear weapons is a reasonable decision to defend the regime from foreign nations' nuclear invasions. Pyongyang's main propaganda outlet also said the regime was providing Seoul with a nuclear umbrella guaranteeing the future of both Koreas. The statement comes as an attempt to create more division within South Korea over the deployment of the U.S. made that missile defense system. Seoul and Washington decided to deploy the Advanced Anti-Missile Defense Unit in July in the face of Pyongyang's continuous provocations, including several back-to-back -back ballistic missile launches. President Park in her Liberation Day speech on Monday made it clear that South Korea has no plans to cancel the THAAD deployment, calling in a self-defense measure to protect the nation from the North's reckless provocations. The president's hardline stance on North Korea was also emphasized by the Unification Ministry, which said on Tuesday that even pressing matters such as the reunions of families separated during the Korean War don't take precedence over the current state of affairs on the Korean Peninsula. The Unification Ministry also stressed the government's stance, saying there will be no inter-Korean exchanges unless the North gives up its nuclear weapons program. This was also highlighted by President Park's Liberation Day speech when she omitted proposing inter-Korean family reunions for the first time since taking office. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The residents of South Korea's Hangzhou County fear for the worst as a U.S. missile defense system is set to be stationed in their hometown. As part of efforts to better inform and provide reassurance regarding the battery and radar safety, the nation's defense minister is set to pay a visit and hold meetings with the locals. For details, let's turn to our Kim Hyun bin South Korean Defense Minister Han min gu is scheduled to visit Hangzhou County, the designated location for the THAAD missile defense system, on Wednesday. Songju residents are deeply opposed to the government's decision to station the THAAD battery in their county, as they believe there are potential health risks from the system's powerful expand radar. Minister Han will visit Songju on August 17th at 2 p.m. to hold talks with the local residents. The purpose is to listen to the residents' point of view, and if possible, the minister will give a briefing on why Songju is the most suitable location for THAAD. This will be Han's second visit to Songju, some 300 kilometers southeast of Seoul. After Seoul and Washington announced the deployment in July. That month, the defense minister visited Songju with Prime Minister Hwang Yuan, but they were met by local protesters who were unwilling to hold talks. China has also condemned the deployment, claiming the THAAD radar could seriously harm its national security interests. South Korea and the U.S. have repeatedly said the THAAD deployment is purely defensive in nature and the system will only be used to counter North Korea's growing missile threats. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Moving on to other stories, South Korea's GDP ranking rose last year, even though the country was suffering from sagging exports and sluggishness in key industries. But a better ranking doesn't necessarily mean major improvements in the economy. Here's our Kim Min-ji with a closer look into the numbers. The Korean economy ranked as the world's 11th largest last year, marking a recovery after nine years. Korea ranked 11th in 2006 and then went downhill, falling to 15th place in the wake of the global financial crisis in 2008. Since then, it has been picking up slowly until it finally bounced back up to 11th. In dollar-denominated terms, the country's GDP came to $1.38 trillion in 2015. 
But it's not all good news, as Korea's rise through the ranks happened as other economies contracted, not because the country saw economic growth. According to the World Bank's calculations, Korea's GDP fell 2.4 percent in 2015 from the year before. Unlike the Bank of Korea, which uses an annual average exchange rate, the World Bank uses a three-year average exchange rate. During the same period, Russia's GDP fell almost 35 percent, and Australia saw its economy shrink nearly 8 percent, as both were hit hard by faltering commodity prices. The U.S. topped the GDP list with almost $18 trillion, followed by China, Japan and Germany. But experts say the rankings itself have little meaning. The fact that we're sitting in 11th place shows that the economy has grown significantly. But the ranking itself is meaningless. Simply put, it just means Korea has climbed the ranks of the advanced countries and means that its economic growth is actually more likely to contract. In fact, Korea has seen its exports fall every month for over a year now due to slowing global demand and the country is also feeling the impact of the government's corporate restructuring drive. According to the Bank of Korea estimates, the economy is expected to grow 2.7 percent this year, down 0.1 percentage point from an earlier forecast. Kim min Arirang News. Scientists at NASA revealed July was the hottest month on record. They say the sweltering conditions are down to the combination of man-made climate change and the effects of El Nino. Wu Su Young explains further. This July was the world's hottest month in recorded history. According to NASA, July 2016 was 0.84 degrees Celsius hotter than the 1951 to 1980 global average, taking into account both the sea surface temperature and air temperature on land. That 0.11 degrees above the previous record set in July 2011 and July 2015, which had been tied for the hottest month. July also marked the 10th consecutive month of record heat, according to NASA. The United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says the record-breaking period has been 14 months. Scientists say much of the heat was trapped by greenhouse gases caused by the burning of fossil fuels. Record-breaking levels of El Niño warming also triggered the scorching conditions. El Niño has been developing since 2014, which caused tropical water to heat up. This then affected air temperatures on land, pushing temperatures up globally and caused unusual weather changes. As the residual heat from El Niño cools off, scientists expect the extreme conditions to stabilize by September or October, thanks to the cooler ocean temperatures of La Niña, which kicked in this June in the equatorial Pacific. However, this isn't to say global temperatures will subside in the long run. Scientists expect more surprises down the line. The amount of carbon in the atmosphere has been on the rise, reaching 406.8 parts per million this June. This triggers the greenhouse effect, raising temperatures all over the world. As long as global warming continues, climate change will, of course, persist, and temperatures will climb every year. Scientists say in terms of tackling global warming and its effects on climate, there's not much that can be done, except limit the damage by cutting carbon emissions. That means sticking to international protocols like the Paris Agreement signed by 180 countries last year. Wu Xiang, Arirang News. Team Korea was handed a humbling defeat in some of the events they expected to land medals in, but it wasn't all doom and gloom. Yoon Shin gives us the highlights and a wrap-up of the day's events in Rio. Monday was a bit of a bumpy day for Team Korea in Rio, as the nation saw some disappointing results in badminton, an event for which the nation had high medal hopes. In the men's doubles, the top-ranked team of Lee Yong-dae and Yoo Yeon-sung suffered a shock defeat in the quarterfinals against the 12th-ranked Malaysian duo, losing two sets to one. And the other Korean pair, third-ranked Kim Sarang and Kim ki Jung, also crashed out in the round of 16, losing to China. In the semifinal of the men's team table tennis, Korea was taken apart three sets to one by a seemingly invincible Chinese team. It was an incredibly tough match with Chang Young-sik, Lee Sang-soo and Ju se facing three of the world's top four players. Korea still has a shot at a medal though, as the team is set to play in the bronze medal match against Germany on Wednesday. However, things were better for Team Korea in the women's doubles badminton after it secured a semifinal berth. 
beating a duo from the Netherlands two sets to one, Chen Kyung-un and Shin Seung chan are set to face off against Japan in the semis. In women's gymnastics, with three Olympic golds already in the bag, America's Simone Biles snagged a bronze. The 19-year-old slipped on a flip and grabbed the beam to rebalance herself, which ended up costing her. Crushing dreams while giving hope to others. Day 10 of the Rio Olympics had lots of thrills and spills, an unpredictability that's likely to continue for the rest of the games. Yi Eun-shin, Arirang News. An athlete from one of the most isolated places in the world that helped his infamous regime make headlines for a positive reason for a change. North Korean gymnast Ri se a two-time world vault champion, stood atop the podium by winning the men's vault event with a score of 15.691. It's Ri's first Olympic gold medal and Pyongyang's second in Rio. During the award ceremony, Chang Wung, the only North Korean member of the International Olympic Committee, handed the gold to Ri. That concludes our newscast for this hour. More updates coming your way at 10 p.m. Korea time. For now, thank you for watching.